Well, welcome to the show. I'm Brandon. I'm Corey, and this is Our View from the Bench. Welcome back, Benchwarmers. Round two of our MLB division breakdown is here as we cover the central divisions in each league. We move to the heartland of America, covering those flyover states. Here's everything you need to know about the AL and NL Central. I'm Brendan, backup bullpen catcher. And I'm Corey, clubhouse mud rubber, and this is RV from the Bench. Now, before we get started, if you're not already, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you never miss a new episode. Also, if you like what you see, smash that like button for us. It's free for both of us, and it probably helps more than you think. We continue our tour of the middle of the country, and now we're going to give our NL Central predictions. We're still going to do it the how we've done it before. Uh, we're going to, for if you haven't watched any of the previous videos, make sure you go check those out. We cover the AL West, the NL West, and we've so far also covered the AL Central. We're going to be moving to the AL and the NL East coming up. Make sure you check out the entire series. If you haven't, though, we're gonna, what we do is we take the standings from the previous year, and we're going to kind of grade each team, discuss each team, and then put them in the standings this year. So... In the NL Central last year, surprisingly, because this is one of those teams, like, besides, like, the Yankees and up there, this team has a lot of World Series. There's a lot of history here. Last place last year in the NL Central, though, was the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah. Do you see them being this bad again? No, I don't. I can't imagine they would be as bad. I don't necessarily see them going crazy and, you know, shocking the world and being like the best team in the NL or anything, but I definitely right. don't have them finishing last in the NL central. I mean, they're just too good. If you look at the, I mean, the, the corners alone, you have Goldschmidt and uh, Nolan Arenado. Like it doesn't make any sense that they can finish that bad. Like Seriously. I just don't get it. So uh, they also have Lars new bar in the outfield. They do have Wilson Contreras as a catcher. So they have some like good pieces and foundation. Uh, they have a couple other young guys they brought up through their system. Cause they, Again, the cardinal way. They tend to draft well and build the team the right way. <clears throat> it does help that they brought back uh, some veteran pitchers to be in the rotation this year. They brought Lance Lynn back, who actually started his career back in 2011 with the Cardinals and helped them win the World Series back then, although I, I think he was a reliever at that time. But still, uh, then they did bring Sonny Gray in, who we mentioned in the last episode, how he left the Minnesota Twins. So that's a huge part and I think a huge help for them to have. Uh, and they also still have Steven Matz. Now, Matz hasn't been as good the three years he's been in St. Louis since he left the Mets, but, or actually, I think he was in Toronto for a year in between. But regardless, like, Matz is like an all over, overall pretty solid three guy in the rotation. Mm -hmm. So if those guys can stay healthy and they can have a bounce back year from Matz, I think they have an opportunity to improve themselves and at least get into the middle division and get to third. Also, doesn't help or hurt that they brought Matt Carpenter back. Now, Carpenter's numbers. Oh, wow. Are, I forgot about yeah, Matt Carpenter. Now, his numbers aren't going to scream or, or jump off the page or anything. He's more of a veteran locker room presence guy. He was a Cardinal. He is a Cardinal. Yes, yeah, exactly. He was there also when they won in 2011. So they're bringing the gang back in a sense. Is Albert Pujols coming back? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, think so. We're, we're stopping here at the 2011. Stop there. Okay, got it. All right. Um, but having him there as a DH or a pinch hitter or just, like I said, a clubhouse guy to kind of keep them – kind of back to getting into the Cardinal way, as they like to say, I think will be something that improves. Now, it is weird, though, that last year they finished last place and they got their coach an extension. I think that was a little strange. So he's locked <laughs> maybe in. Maybe they just knew it was off. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I mean, that's kind of how I feel. And again, with Arenado and Goldschmidt, I feel like you should be a little bit better in general overall from last year. So I see them jumping from fifth to third. Okay. Oh, breaking news. David Fries is signing as well. He's re-signing <laughs> back in St. Louis. It's going to be hilarious. They're not bringing everybody back, but I, I hear, I'm hear, I hear you on, on that, and I couldn't agree more that last place is not in the cards for them. Um, in my opinion, this team is competing for like arguably the most talented team in this division uh, because they kind of have a lot of it. Now, they have a lot of the top talent. They're just kind of lacking a lot of depth. Again, headlined by Goldie and Arenado, especially on the corners, like you mentioned. But to me, and you touched on it a bit, it's their pitching that is the best, in my opinion, is kind of what's going to keep them in it all year. Sonny Gray, Lance Lynn, Steven Mass, like you mentioned, but even Miles Mikolas and Kyle Gibson mm -hmm. are like good three, four, or four, five guys. Again, not everybody can have aces throughout their entire lineup. Not everybody, you know, not even the Dodgers have that, to be honest with yeah. you. True. So just having, you know, having a good and then having the tiers is what they got. And, and to me, I think they have some of the best uh, starting rotation, at least in this, in this central division. And because of those two things, I have them 
definitely jumping up from last place. I don't have him taking it kind of like you. I'm going to try to be a little bit, you know, regular here and not just jump all in on the Cardinals bandwagon. But I have them a little bit higher than you. I have them actually coming in second this year. Now, barely. I think it's going to be really tight with the three teams at the top. But I got the Cardinals coming in second. Okay, not bad. Again, we both see them vastly improving from last year because I'm just so used to them, even if they don't win the division, at least being in the race for it come to August and even early September. And then, you know, the last few years maybe kind of tapering off from there and not winning it. But it's just weird to see them in last place last year. Yes, last is weird. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Especially when you look at some of the teams in this division. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which, moving on to this next one, is kind of the one that, Brett, you're talking about here. The team that came in fourth place last year is a team over in Pittsburgh, which I believe got voted as the best ballpark in Major League Baseball, at least for maybe views. And I've only seen pictures of it. You've been there in person, haven't you? I Pittsburgh have. Pirates. I have to say Pittsburgh is... Man, it's it's definitely in top three. It's like I think like it's Pit, Petco, Pittsburgh, and... Red and Fenway. Those are like my three oh, love top Fenway. three. So I, I, I totally understand the it, part of it is, is their stadium is the second smallest as far as attendance and seating capacity, but uh, beyond behind uh, Fenway. Cause it's obviously Fenway is a hundred and plus. Yeah. Years old. Uh, yeah. It's like 35,000 people. You're on top of the field. You have the yellow bridges behind that go oh, across sick. the street into downtown Pittsburgh, which is absolutely amazing and a beautiful view. So I'm with everybody who thinks it's the top stadium in the, in the, in the league. I'm right there with him. And like I said, what about their play on the field? field? It's right there. Well, play on the field is is another, is another thing. (laughs) You know, it's weird. They have a couple like good young guys, like Mm -hmm. O'Neill Cruz at short is kind of like their Ellie Dela Cruz, a big guy who's playing short and can do a lot of things. But that be, and then Brian Reynolds in the outfield, who they actually was talking about maybe trading him a year or two ago, but they didn't end up doing that. So they still have him. They have a really good young third baseman, Cabrian Hayes, who has been talked about for the last like three years coming up the system that he's the next guy. He's going to be the future of this team. So they have all those guys. But beyond that, there's a lot of question marks. Like I'm looking at their pitching staff. I don't even know who these guys are. Like Martin Perez and Marco Gonzalez are like some veteran guys, but again, not anybody to write home about kind of 500 pitchers ERAs between four and five. Mm. So nothing crazy. Yeah. And if they're not scoring a lot of runs, then it's really not going to matter either. Um, they do have one positive though. They did bring in Araldis Chapman to be at the back end of the bullpen. Oh, yeah. Uh, their closer from last year, David Bednar was one of the best in majors um, in a weird way that he had, a, I don't know, top five saves and they had like no wins. So that tells you <laughs> That's pretty how crazy. good he is in general. Every time they're in a game, he's the guy. Any opportunity he's got it locked down. Yeah, gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> now with Chapman, it could be he's a one year deal. If they're not competing come July, then they can trade him and get something and maybe get a minor leaguer to continue to build and rebuild this team as a, as a whole. Uh, they did bring in uh, Andrew McCutcheon back for like a retirement tour. Essentially, I can't imagine he's going to be playing much longer, but he's back to where he started his career and hopefully can, again, kind of be like the carpenter in, in St. Louis, be that veteran clubhouse guy, kind of teach these guys how to go about business and be a professional and, and try to at least compete in games, if not win more than they did last year. But I still have them dropping down to fifth because I think the Cardinals are going to improve so much that they're definitely not going to be behind them this year. Yeah, yeah. And this is you have the Cardinals, what, third, you said? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the Pirates aren't improving, unfortunately, because the team that was below them is, in my opinion, going to be a lot better. They kind of have settled into last place. To be honest with you, I can't believe the Pirates are, to this day, on April 1st, not April Fool's, undefeated, still undefeated this season. They swept the uh, Marlins, and then they beat the Nationals today. So I th- that's pretty cool, something I don't see a lot of going forward, to be honest <laughs> with you, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm with you. O'Neill Cruz, probably the best player. Brought in Andrew McCutcheon as that uh, vet presence and obviously a designated hitter. We'll see how much he's still got in the tank as far as hitting goes. Yeah. But at least he doesn't have to be running around center field at the same time, um, chasing Ooh. down freaking fly balls from these pitchers that we have no idea who they are. Um, the Pirates are going to give teams trouble, right? I mean, every they're all Major League Baseball teams, but uh, in my opinion, it's, it's not going to be much. I, too, have the Pirates coming in fifth place in the NL Central this year. That's too bad because the Pirates are so – It's like I said, the stadium's amazing. The fans are great because they're the same Steelers and Penguins. Yeah, it's all black and gold care. in that city. Mm-hmm. It just it sucks that they're not going to be good yet, but I don't think it's time yet. It's so crazy. They're the only city I know of that makes sure that mm-hmm. all of their sports are the same. Yep. All like color schemes at least. Yeah. You know I mean? only, only town in all of America. It's kind of weird, but also kind of cool. Kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, no matter what you're wearing, oh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh something. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
<clears throat> All right, let's move out of Pittsburgh. We're going to head over to the third place team from last year, which is the Cincinnati Reds. Um, I I really like the Reds. Uh, I mean, in the sense that as long as they're not doing anything to mess up what the Diamondbacks are doing, because obviously being in the National League, nice. I don't root for them a ton. But as long as they're not, you know, in our way, I kind of like the Reds, dude. Where do you see them, uh, you know, third last year? What you doing? Yeah, I actually see him improving this year and, and getting into second place and getting above the Cardinals. I think Hunter Green at the top of the rotation has been, uh, I mean, he's a flamethrower. He's been talked about for a while, and I think having another co- a year under his belt is going to be good. Uh, Frankie Montez, who, again, young guy at the top of the rotation with Green, I think they're going to be really good and continue to grow and improve their ERA from the last two years and win more games than they did the year before. Uh, there's another pitcher that they have that I don't think a lot of people even really know about, but Graham Ashcraft, who is going to be a great third guy. He, now, over the last two years, he's slowly built up his innings from, I think, 120 to 150. So if he can get to like the 180, 190 mark and continue to do what he was doing over the last two years, I think it gives them three solid guys at the top of the rotation. Uh, they have a young, a ton of young talent. They have first baseman Christian Encarnacion Strand, who, again, last year only played 63 games, but had a really good 63 games in the back half getting called up. And I think having that experience and being able to build on it will be only beneficial to him and the team. Uh, Jonathan India, who at second play at uh, second base over the last three years has averaged 15 home runs and 50 RBIs. So again, a, a solid defensive. I think there was even talk of him making the all-star game last year, but he didn't ultimately make it. So there's some young talent there. And of course you have Del Ellie Dela Cruz at shortstop and that guy, Bro. Ooh, man, he's electric. Is he not? He is. And he burst out on the scene last year. Had a great start, and then you know, kind of slowed down in the back half. But it's one of those: it's your first year in the majors. Yeah, dude, can figure you out. You got to adapt and make some changes in the off season and and get better at certain certain pitches. I think he's going to do that. I think he can have um, a great year as a full year player. He's you know, again, knows what he's doing, knows what to expect. And the other one that I don't know if a lot of people know who Will Benson is, who their center fielder is, but he has been there the last two years, and he has been really. Last year he played in 108 games, uh, batted 275, which in this day and age. If you bet over 250, you're like doing great because that's all we talk about is analytics and guys that just need to hit home runs no matter how many they strike out. But he right. got 11 home runs, eight triples, 15 doubles. So he does a little bit of everything. Not a whole lot of pop as far as out of it's the like park. The Kyle but... Schwarber syndrome. Yeah, and he's got a little <laughs> bit of speed. He's kind of a smaller guy. Yeah, not as not, not, not like yeah, Kyle not when it comes to that part. <laughs> uh, but plays great defense. So I think having that up the middle with Dela Cruz and him in center field, as, as they say in baseball, you want to be strong up the middle. Uh, and build from out from there. So I think that's going to be a huge thing for them. Maybe and that then, was the Cardinals' problem. They got really good corners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. That's a good point. Goldie <laughs> and him are corner guys and not up the middle. So I just think there's a lot of things to be excited about. The Reds did compete down to the wire, really, for that wild card spot last year, but ultimately fell short. So I think this year they can be a team that actually gets over the hump and maybe even gets a wild card spot finishing second in this division. I can see that. Okay. Um, I, I don't have them there, but I do have them in the top three, but unfortunately I have them staying pat at number three. I'll root you with the Ellie De La Cruz, dude. That dude is, I mean, like I said before, he's electric, dude. He's so fun to watch. Um, yeah. In the field, he does some crazy plays, rounding the bases, he can hit. But but beyond that, that's kind of as far as the known talent goes for the Reds. Um, obviously, Joey Votto was uh, pretty helpful last year in kind of being that veteran presence to help lead that team. He has gone, uh, and I don't think there's really much left yet right and he since he since Cruz can't carry the load by himself it's just it's it might be a waiting game there is a lot of young talent though with room to grow kind of like what you were talking about last year they elevated four rookie positions to regulars uh as far as you know being their regular starters so right now the iron is kind of hot with this young team maybe they follow like a that Orioles way right where if mm-hmm. if they can get all this young talent to hit at the same time it could turn into something special. If not, and it's, you know, staggered, it's going to be a little bit longer process. But uh, I see it kind of being that the latter, the staggered. I don't know if they get as lucky as the Orioles have and go from damn near last place to over 100 wins. Um, so I have the Reds coming in third. And it's really only because the teams that I have above them are just tough. It's not ne- not necessarily a shot at the Reds. Yeah, understandable. They're young. And again, like you said, if they can get all this young talent to kind of blend together, kind of like Oklahoma City and NBA, like they've been oh yeah, that's a great draft picking all these guys and building all these young players. And finally, it's kind of come to fruition of all of them kind of playing together and blending at the right time. Maybe this is the year for Cincinnati. Maybe they're an extra year away. But 
I mean, it also depends on health. If these guys are all young and haven't played full seasons before, if they end up not being able to get through it all because they haven't played that many games before, it could ultimately end up being another year or two away from them really having a chance in the NL Central. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of why I have them at third because it's a show me kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like I could see around the edges that you guys got some talent. Show me that it, that it all works. Uh, so I kind of have them saying staying pat. But I do believe that the top three are probably within five games of each other um, as we kind of get down to the end. So I don't think they're in third because they're 20 games back or anything like that. I just think they're in third because the teams that are above them are, are really good. It's a good division in a weird way. <laughs> yeah. One of those teams that we were talking about, actually, we're going to move on, is second place last year, Chicago Cubs. We mentioned Javi Baez, uh, who is no longer here, obviously, but we mentioned him in the AL Central uh, video that we just did. What do you got? What do you see for the Cubs this year? Well, there's only one spot left to fill on my prediction list, obviously, at this point. So, no, matter of fact. Oh, you're right. You're right. I do have one more. Uh, So I have them actually finishing at the top of the division. I think that there's a lot of things kind of going their way this year. Uh, Justin Steele, who was really good last year, even though the Cubs were not great, uh, finished 16 and five with a 3.06 ERA. Uh, They still have Kyle Hendricks, who was part of their World Series team in 2016. Solid uh, pitcher in the in the as a two. Uh, and then they also added, uh, I hope I say his name right, Shota Imanaga from Japan. Imanaga. Mm-hmm. Imanaga, okay. Who last year in Japan, I know it's Japan and it takes time, guys, for kind of convert over, but he had a great start today against the Rockies, although it is the Rockies, I'll give him that. Um, but last year in Japan, he had a 2.78 ERA and was also the winning pitcher in the championship game against USA in the World Baseball Classic last year. So he's seen some of these MLB talent and bats, so it's not something he's going to be completely foreign to in a sense. So I think that'll help him. So those three guys should be a nice top of the rotation for them to compete and get, I think, a much better uh, output this year than last year. Um, Dansby Swanson at short is uh, amazing and great at defense. Uh, I know he's only a career 250 hitter, but I think it's more about what he does beyond just his average. He gets on base because he's got a good eye. He steals a few bases but has decent speed. So if these other bats behind him, Ian Happ, being one of those guys who has had some pop the last couple years, last year 21 home runs and 84 RBIs, I think can kind of move things around and get this offense going. Um, obviously it does also help that they re-sign Cody Bellinger, who had a great year last year, finally figured himself out again after being such a struggle those last two or three years in LA with the Dodgers. I think he's yeah. finally found himself, feels comfortable, got a contract. Now it's not a long-term deal like he wanted, but it has got some opt-outs. And if he competes and does what he did last year, he can opt out and go get more money as well. So I think that's going to be a big part of it. And the biggest thing for me, really, I think, is that it helps they hired Craig Council. Like, Craig Council, as we are Dimeback fans, we know he was a huge part of that team in 2001. And he also was on the Marlins in 1997 and was the game-winning run off of Edgar Renteria's game-winning hit. So he's been around a lot of winning. He knows. Spent, I think, uh, nine years with the Brewers. And not only that, in that time, they had three division titles, two wildcard wins, uh, like two wildcard spots, uh, they did lose to the Dodgers in the 2018 NLCS, so they've been far. And even doing so in Milwaukee, like the last couple of years, winning six of the last seven divisions, like, I mean, they won first place last year and he was in voting for manager of the year. And then he decided, they decided not to bring him back. Like, it's just a weird concept to me that doesn't really make it a whole lot of sense. Now, I know the Brewers brought in a new GM, so that might be part of it, but still, like, you just finished first and went to the playoffs. Why would you want to replace your coach? So I think having his winning mentality going into the Cubs and their organization and all these pieces they brought in is going to be a great marry and our marriage, I should say. And they're going to be able to just win this division. I, I, again, this division is not going to be easy like the AL central, but I don't think it's going to be super tough either. It should be something they should be able to handle and ultimately get on top. Yeah. Put simply to me, they've got arguably the best overall roster. Uh, and the main thing that really put me to, to kind of vault them towards the top, because I also have them coming in first is what you mentioned in Craig Council. I mean, he took a Milwaukee team that nobody really saw anybody. Now, granted, there was a team. I'm, how did they do in the playoffs last year, Milwaukee? I think they lost two games to Arizona. Oh, that's right. That's in right. Milwaukee. That was fantastic. Yeah, that's a good, good time. Maybe that's why they got rid of him. I don't know. Maybe they need a new face. To me, I'm with you, though. I don't think it was worth it. I think Council is one of the best managers out there. And I think that's, in my opinion, what puts the Cubs over the top, especially since they had been doing decent with uh ross what was his first name cody ross 
that was his first name? The I think right. The, he's he's a catcher for them. Catcher for yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't remember his first name. Um no, David but Ross. David Dave, Ross. Yeah, yeah, that sounds better. Okay. So so yeah, so I mean it, an improvement there in my opinion. That's not even really a shot at, at David Ross. It's just, you know, the experience that Craig Council has kind of come with. Yeah. Um but the team's got talent, you know, especially since they didn't have to overpay for Bellinger, at least not on a long-term overpay. It might be, depending on how he pans out, uh, this year be an overpay. But I, I think it's a great deal for the Cubs. Uh, not so much for the Bellinger. I mean, Bellinger's getting paid regardless, right? But, yeah. you know, he was looking for the longer-term deal. But Swanson, Bellinger, Suzuki, obviously Suzuki, you mentioned I some. forgot about mm-hmm. him. You also mentioned the starting pitching with Justin Steele and Shota Imanaga, who today you did mention, but I wanted to note six innings pitched full complete two hits, nine strikeouts. The first uh, hit that he gave up was in that sixth inning. So he was hitless wow. through five. Um, so yeah. he looks really good already to begin. I think the Cubs should be able to stay atop of the division. It's going to be close, but I think they should be able to kind of, incrementally stay above the Cardinals and the Reds. Again, I kind of have the top three finishing all within five games-ish of each other. Mm-hmm. Cubs might be able to sneak it out towards the end a little bit, but I think the Cards and Reds are going to be uh, really close for a second and not too far behind uh, Chicago. So yeah, I, forgot I got the Cubs in first two. He was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. They, they actually have a, a really good overall roster. I think the best in this division, and that's really why I kind of have them at the top. And then you sprinkle in that Craig Council magic right on top, bro. I mean, it doesn't really mm-hmm. get much better than that. And I'm with you on David Ross was a good coach when they had him initially, but he also didn't have the experience beforehand nah. of his managerial job. Council has done this a while. And I think again, council now Ross was a catcher. We talked about how catchers are usually good managers. Mm-hmm. It's also guys that are more like utility, not big name guys that went around. Like again, council won two world series as a player in two completely different organizations at different and two lower standard, lower tier organizations. Yeah. I'm not trying to knock on the no. Marlins or the Diamondbacks. I was, he's my favorite team, but be being real here you know what i mean yeah exactly so i think having that experience and being one of those guys that knows the game really well is going to be a huge plus for this team and i think he did so well like you mentioned in milwaukee where there was not really expectations for them to compete let alone win multiple divisions in his time there as a coach so i think the cubs are going to be the ultimate winners here with him having been taken over the reins yeah yep all right well that leaves us with the last one and actually what we've been doing lately is I think for almost every single one, the last one has always been first place from the previous and the first place before, but we haven't left first place this time. We've nope. got the Brewers left, and if y'all been paying attention, we both only have one spot left, and it's the same one. Brewers finish where, Corey? Yeah, fourth. I think, you know, we mentioned Council leaving alone is a huge drop. Uh, they also traded Corbin Burns to the Orioles about a month ago, so that now they have no ace at the top of their rotation. They're going to be basically taking it all down to these young kids and hoping for the best with these guys. Uh, they all, I mean, they also have Wade Miley who I didn't even realize he was, I think he's like 38 years old and still pitching, which Ouch. is Dang, kind of crazy know. to me. Uh, Brandon Woodruff, who's on the year, starting the year on the IL. So again, two old veteran guys, they're, they're waiting to see if they can continue on. Uh, Freddie Peralta is going to be their ace now and he's okay, but I, there's nobody any really, but behind him in the rotation. That's going to be, I think a solid two, which is when they're really going to struggle when he's not pitching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, which well, he can't pitch every game. So yeah, 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 you can't be, this is, and he's not going to pitch more than five or six innings because that's not how this works anymore in mm-hmm. baseball. Um, I think I heard a stat the other day back in, I want to say it was like 1985 pitchers would go through the third time of the bro- of the batting lineup, like 56% of the time or something like that. It was like but over 50% for sure. And these days it's down to like 12 and a half percent. Like pitchers Whoa. just go through the third the lineup three times anymore. That's just not a well, thing. Because the stats say that yeah, after two at bats, then they know what you're gonna do. Like exactly. Geez. So I think that's gonna be a big problem with them. Now, offensively, they might not be terrible. They added Reese Hoskins, who didn't play last year for Philly due to injury, but the years, the two years prior, he had 25 or more home runs, 75 or more RBIs. So he, a little legit bat in the top of the lineup. He's already done good. He started off really well against New York the other day and, and against the Mets, and then they threw at him because he pissed them off because of some, you know baseball rules. You throw behind you the have bat. to. Yeah, it was dumb. The guy, he slid in the second. They got mad at the way he slid, but I'm like, I didn't see anything. No, it was dumb. I saw you. I yeah, agree. it's just ridiculous. But regardless, uh, he's going to be a nice bat in the middle lineup. They did bring in a uh, veteran, Gary Sanchez, who, you know, has some pop left in his in his at bat. Uh, he's got 19 homers and 50 RBIs averaged over the last three years, which is pretty good considering he's on the back end of his career and an aging catcher usually doesn't For have a, catcher, a lot of offense yeah. left. So they have two legit bats there. 
Uh, they do have the young outfielder, Saul uh, Freelick, they brought up last year, who had a good run, but again, 57 games. So let's see what he does with a full season. But other than that, I think the rebuild officially begins in Milwaukee, and they're going to drop from first to fourth, which is probably going to be one of the most dramatic changes in uh, division places, I think, in all of baseball this year. That's the one that we have so far as the most dramatic, uh, at least reviewing the previous ones uh, that we've done. Who knows where we'll go with, with, the, with the Eastern uh, Conference, the Eastern Conference, wow, <laughs> with the Eastern teams, uh, it, those divisions. But um, before I, before I kind of touch on it, you know, I've always wondered – why I, to me i've always thought that catchers should be the best hitters they see the same point of view the entire game or at least very near it you know what i mean i get that they're in the middle of the plate and then to the side of the plate obviously as a batter but i've always wondered like why aren't you really good don't you see everything that's coming at you shouldn't you be able to tell which one's which I, now granted when you're catching you know what's coming to you but yeah. i just always thought like don't you see this oh this is the only view you get the whole yeah, game you, you should you be good think- at this you would think having catch, having to catch everything and watch it into your glove, even if you do know where it's coming, you'd be better at reading the ball out of a hand right. than yeah. most other players. But that's, that's, that's my thought. It's always been my thought. Uh, okay. Uh, Brewers, to be honest with you, actually have a fairly decent roster for us to kind of have them down this far. But I think that the loss of counsel that you touched on and really the advancement of the other teams in this group is really kind of what drops them down to fourth. Not necessarily to anything on their own. I just think that the Cubs, Cardinals, and Reds are really surging right now. Um, but, you know, my thought is the top four will all be within five to seven games of each other, kind of like I mentioned. So I think it's going to be close. Yelich, William Contreras, and Reese Hoskins, the big names that you've mentioned. Uh, Freddie Peralta and Wade Miley in the rotation. They're going to compete, right? They're going to compete all year. But my guess is they fall kind of just outside. I have them settling in fourth. Man, I forgot well. Yelich was still playing baseball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's still trying. I mean, that guy won a freaking MVP, did he not? Or was Did he, he close? Win it or I think he was close. I don't think he actually okay. won the MVP, but I think he was in the discussion for one year. Uh, okay, okay. I mean, but I mean, hey, to be in discussion, then to wonder if he's still in the league, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I feel like he's savored off so much the last few years. I kind of forgot or thought maybe he retired and kind of called it a day. But I mean, depending on how big of a contract he signed when he was in his heyday, that's all guaranteed money. You ain't gonna retire until you get all that money in your pocket. So. Yeah, National League MVP 2018. He, oh, he, he did was win. Okay. Yep. Yeah, oh, it was Braun that didn't get it, but should have gotten it back in the day. That's who I Yeah, was 100%. No, no, not Actually, no. It was the Kemp. other way around. Yes, it was Kemp that should have got it when Braun did get it. And then and I'm not even a Dodger did. fan. Matt Kemp uh, deserved to win it that year. Yeah, and then Braun cheated because he tested positive and tried yes. to cover it up. And then that was the year that they beat the Dimebacks in the playoffs and we should have yes. faced them. So, yes. Yeah, we just I just hate the Brewers. Screw the Brewers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, dude, honestly, I used to like Ryan Braun. I used to root for that guy. He seemed like a chill dude playing in Milwaukee. And then all this stuff came out. Again, I am an adamant Dodger hater. I cannot stand them. But Matt Kemp deserved that MVP. I don't care what anybody says. I yep. He deserves it, and it's bullshit that he got it. So it it's is crazy, it too, because you look back, Kemp was never the same after that year. Like, that was his best year. Yeah, it hurt his feelings so much. Yeah, yeah you're right. I'm not saying that's what it did. I'm just no, saying. No, but, I mean, he fell apart. They traded him to San Diego. He fell apart even more physically, and then it just – he was never the same after that year. He had one really amazing year and then just kind of teetered off from there. But, Matt, you deserved it, bro. You deserved it. Brian Braun didn't freak. He stole it. And he, it the crazy part was Braun – not only was he juiced, he didn't even have better numbers than Kemp. That was what made no. it so irritating. So, again, and, Dodger hater here, but check it in for Matt Kemp, bro. You deserve you or not. I don't remember what the standings were back then, but I had to think maybe the, the, the Brewers have a slightly better record than the Dodgers that Probably. year. Probably. That, yeah, that's I had my to guess. Because usually it's, you know, the best player on the best team. kind of. Yeah, thing. maybe for basketball and football, but I don't I don't know. Yeah, but it's not baseball. That. Shonohei Otani won two MVPs. His team didn't make the playoffs. So what am <laughs> Thank I Thank you. About? Exactly. That's my <laughs> point. So I'm with you as far as best player on best team, especially when it comes to basketball. Um, and, and then borderline football too, but, uh, yeah, anyways, we got completely off track on the anti Ryan Braun pro Matt Kemp, it but happens. either way, that's, <laughs> that's just how we feel. Okay. All right. Well, that was pretty good. It's a nice little lineup here. Some switching up. I think the biggest one, obviously for both of us is the Brewers falling. Yeah. Um, exactly. but it was pretty good. I think it's going to be pretty exciting <clears throat> before we get out of here. We're going to do what we've done in this series so far. We're going to try to come up with a headline that kind of best suits this division, whether that be a player in the division, a full team, or the division itself. So, Corey, start me off, man. What's this oh, this uh, this year's headline for the NL Central? I think a big part of the Cubs getting to where they are going to get and win the division. That means Cody Bellinger is going to have to have an even better year than he did last year. And I think that the shocker to the world would be is if the Cubs have like maybe the third best record in baseball – 
and Cody Bellinger has like 35 to 40 home runs, 100 plus RBIs, and ends up winning the MVP for the NL. I know everyone's probably thinking one of the three Dodgers will probably win the MVP, yeah. but I think part of it too is is you know Freddie's already won one, Mookie's already won one, Otani's already won two. I feel like there's a little bit of fatigue sometimes, and everyone's just going to expect the Dodgers to be good. And if all three of them have amazing years is it something we're going to be like well then one of them deserves an mvp or is it a guy on a team where he literally is the best player on the team and this team has a huge turnaround from the previous year and i think that's and again bellinger's on a not on a prove it deal because he has the opt-outs because it's a three-year deal but he's going to go out and play better and want to play and get better numbers than he did last year so that he can actually go get this big contract that boris you know, clients tend it's to promise him basically. And yeah. so I think he's going to come out with a, with, and I think he, again, he feels more at ease. He feels better with himself. He's finally comfortable and, and in his own swing is back. Cause I know again, those last couple of years in LA were a struggle. He was felt like he was changing his swing every three weeks and it just wasn't working and then try something else. And it's like, man, you're just, you're overthinking it. And I feel like he's in Chicago. He's comfortable back where he was last year. We had a great year. And I think he's going to have an even bigger season this year. Okay. We're actually kind of taking this in very similar paths. We're not going with the same person. And I'm not going to be as bold as you, but I'm going with second year player, basically. Ellie De La Cruz finishes top three in MVP voting. And I kind of put it that way for a handful of the reasons you pointed out. The one thing that I'll take away from the Dodgers is, in my opinion, if Otani were to win another MVP, he has to do something other than bat. He can't just hit as a dh and and be mvp I, I mean field for a little bit but, but this is pretty much why he was a shoe in when he was pitching because it's like a dominant pitcher and arguably the best hitter i mean how do you not give it to him but when you're only hitting kind of you know i'm with you on the fatigue the reason why i have uh ellie in third is because a handful of people from the, a couple of people from the Dodgers, a couple of people from the Phillies, and a couple of people from the Braves are probably going to be up competing for that same position. Whether that's Acuna again, or maybe Austin Riley, whether that's uh, Harper or Trey Turner, whether that's you know Betts or Freeman, one of those six, one or two of those six guys might finish above just because of the teams that they're on. Um, but I'm having Ellie kind of right there, especially coming out of nowhere, being not in the MVP voting last year, a rookie last year. I have him coming, finishing in top three. I just think he's that good. Damn. I mean, I'm with you. He's good. And if he if he hasn't, now that he has a whole year under his belt, knows how this is going to go and expect what expectations to have for a season. And if the team is playing better, means he's playing better and they're playing well. So um, it's not a it's not a terrible idea. And we've seen that video of him. Like, he's learning English, right? He's yeah, trying to speak actually... English. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, the fact that he said he wanted to be able to like talk to the fans and understand the fans more. He worked on his English a lot in the off season, so it, it shows you dedication that he's really about trying to be more than just you know a good ball player. He wants to be a good person and a good you know fan favorite in a sense, and not and be able to interact with them. So I think that's mm -hmm. an awesome thing. If you had to put an over under on months that it would take for Otani to learn English, what would you bet on that? <laughs> Well, right now, I guess I'd have to ask Ipe for odds and see what he Yeah, does. you got to get those odds, yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, like, I think I get props because not everybody does that, you know? I'm not saying yeah. that he has to speak English in order no, to be a no. good player, but I think it's cool that exactly what you said, that he said he's trying to be able to connect. He doesn't want to have to use a translator or give small, broken answers to, to yeah. questions. He speaks very well. I mean, he was able to clearly understand the questions that were given to him, reiterate answers, and not just using, like, broken English or, like, random words. So I give him props, props to, yeah. for taking the time to do it. Absolutely. And I, I, I know I've told this story before, but having worked at Angels back in the day when Vladimir Guerrero was there, like, that guy can speak English. They just sometimes <laughs> don't want to or don't want to have to, like, really, like, think and interpret the questions the way they are and, 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 over, and, and not overthink it. But when it's in their foreign language, it's just easier for them to kind of think as they normally would and explain right. the way they see it and not have to, like, really, like, okay, make sure this word means that. So I get not speaking English, but let's be honest. Otani knows some English. He doesn't know. I mean, shit, there, there, there's video of him during spring training when Rojas and, and uh, Hernandez are teaching him Spanish. So I'm sure he has a little bit of English. But, again, with Dela Cruz taking the extra effort to really learn it and be able to can, to talk to the fans is, I think, a bonus. And if you're the Cincinnati Reds and the fans, like, you got to be stoked because he's not only caring about the game, but he's caring about interacting with you guys and yeah. making you feel the love that he's feeling back from you. So I think it's a good thing. Yeah, to your point about Otani, I feel like people ask him questions in English, and then all he does is answer in Japanese. So to your point, I think he understands what people yeah. are saying. He just hasn't taken the time to be able to speak it.
Yeah. And maybe it's difficult. Again, I've heard English is the hardest well, language. Say, to learn, our English but... language is stupid. So <laughs> I can kind of understand why they don't want to learn it or, or get to a point where they feel comfortable enough to just speak it easily. Yeah. But yeah, that kind of, that wraps up this one. Yeah, and uh, again, make sure you check out the rest of our division prediction series. Uh, in this episode, as we uh, said, we selected the NL Central champs. Uh, we'll continue our travels to the East Coast as we wrap up with the last two divisions. So, as always, thank you for seeing things from our view from the bench. I'm Brendan. And I'm Corey. Like we always say, enjoy the sports until we talk again. Peace. This was a Sycamore 4th Studios production.